Well, good morning, Meadowbrook Church. How are we doing today? So glad to see you this morning. Special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We are glad that you are with us as well. So I grew up in the Northeast in a tiny town called Keene, New Hampshire. Tiny town of about uh, 25,000 people, but it is famous for two things. One, we are in the Guinness Book of World Records. Are you ready for this? For having the most lit jack-o'-lanterns on display (laughs) at one time, right? Pretty impressive, right? Other towns tried to beat us, but they couldn't take the title from us. Um, But that's a whole other story for another day. The other thing we're known for is that we had the movie Jumanji filmed in our hometown. Right, right, right. Not the new Jumanji, like the 1995 Jumanji with Robin Williams. Um, I went to the middle school in our town, which was right off. They had like this traffic circle. It's quintessential, quaint New England town. has a main street lined with shops. There's a traffic circle at the top. A big white church with a white steeple at the top of the traffic circle. A gazebo with a fountain in the middle. I mean, it's something you would see on a postcard. And so they overtook our town for a few months, and the middle school was right off this traffic circle. And if if you've ever seen the movie, you remember the movie, there's a scene where all of the animals are tromping through downtown, smashing cars, like that's the center of my town. So Robin Williams had to be there, and so when we were in middle school, we would go out and kind of watch the filming. Teachers would like let us walk down and we'd go on a little class field trip to the movie set and we'd watch Robin Williams run through the streets. And, you know, there were, th- those animals weren't real. I don't know if you know that or not. <laughs> they, they were, you know, CGI later. Uh, so there wasn't any animals. But it was a really exciting uh, time for us. Now, if you don't know the movie Jumanji, it's actually made from a kid's story, a children's book, and the premise of the story is that these kids find this board game in in the attic of their house, and they go to play the game, and what they find is that as you play this board game, the board game comes to life, and the board game actually takes over everything. So in the movie, Robin Williams' character is this guy who's trapped inside the game, because if you don't finish the game till the end, everything gets trapped inside the game. And when you open it back up to play it again, it all comes back out. So he escapes from the game. He was a little boy when he first played, didn't finish. He got trapped inside. Now he's a grown man of 30, 40 years, whatever. And the whole point of the movie is for them to finish the game. Because when you actually finish the game, everything goes back to normal. And everything goes back to the way that it's supposed to be. But it's not just as though they can finish playing the game. Like, there's all of these things that are prohibiting them from playing the game. Because these two worlds, the jungle world of Jumanji and the modern world of their day collide, and the game, like, escapes into the modern world. So you have these big tarantulas that are going all over the place. There's a bounty hunter from the game who's actually chasing Robin Williams. There's monkeys that are running amok. And like rhinos, if you've ever seen the movie, the rhinos and the elephants are destroying the town. It's just chaos. And they have to finish the game so Robin Williams can be free from the game and everything will go back to the way that it's supposed to be. Now, you watch a movie like that, and we just think, oh, that's fantasy. That's a fun kid's story. It's totally disconnected from our world. And in some ways, yes, that's true. It is a fantasy story. I've never played a game, and the games all of a sudden come to life, right? But we use that as a parallel to think about our faith in that the scriptures, while it's not a board game, actually are supposed to operate in our lives in a similar way. Meaning, when we read the scriptures, we're not just reading a story from thousands of years ago. We're reading a book that is alive and active today. And when we honestly read the scriptures and honestly engage with the scriptures, we find that the story of God that's being told in the scriptures actually can and should take over our life today. And as we read and trace through the story of Scripture to the end, we find that the end of the Bible, there's this vision of life going back to the way that it was supposed to be, the way that God intended it to be. And we are people who are on that journey trying to get to the end. We may not all make it in this life, but we get to the end 
trusting that God will someday put everything back to the way that it's supposed to be. And so the question for us is like, do we actually engage the Bible in that way? Like, do we engage the Bible as though it's this alive and active force in our lives that has the ability to take over our lives? Or do we just read it from time to time? Do we pull out a verse here and there when we need a little boost of confidence and then just put it aside? The question is, what does it mean for us to engage with the Word of God as though it is truly a force that can take over our life? This is what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 13. He says, And we also thank God continually. Now, if you're familiar with Paul's writing, this verse in the middle of chapter 2 might seem a little unusual because essentially Paul is giving thanks again, right? Whenever Paul starts a letter, he starts in a very predictable fashion. He writes by giving thanks for the people he's writing to, He also writes a prayer to them, and then he gives some personal word of connection or he longs to see them. That's a standard way, and Paul has already done that in the book of 1 Thessalonians. He's already done all those things. He's already given given thanks at the beginning of chapter 1. He starts saying, we always thank God for all of you, continually mentioning you in our prayers. This is chapter 1, verse 2. Now into verse 3. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel, note that word, if you're somebody who writes in your Bible, underline that word, highlight that word, the gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit in deep conviction. Essentially, the implication being is we brought the gospel to you and you received the gospel. And then Paul spends the rest of chapter 1, the first half of chapter 2, talking about his ministry and his time with the church in Thessalonica. So what's interesting, though, about Paul giving thanks again is that usually that portion of his letter where he's giving thanksgiving and he's praying for them, and he's giving a personal word. It usually is about eight verses long, give or take. Some, verse, some chapters, some books, it's a little longer, some it's a little shorter. For example, if you were to go to the book of Romans, and you were to read Romans 1, once you hit chapter 1, verse 8, Paul starts into his thanksgiving prayer and personal word to them. It lasts until verse 15, about eight verses long. What's interesting is that the book of Romans is 433 verses long. The book of 1 Thessalonians is 89 verses long. Romans is almost five times longer than 1 Thessalonians. But what's interesting is that Paul's thanksgiving and prayer in Romans takes up about 2% of that book. But in the book of 1 Thessalonians, his thanksgiving, his prayer, and his personal word take up almost 50% of the book. He's giving thanks yet again. He's praying for them yet again. He's going to give another personal word as we finish out chapter 2 and move into chapter 3 yet again. And notice why he's giving thanks. Like, notice what it is about what's happening in their life as to why he's giving thanks. Verse 13, and we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as human word, but as it actually is, the word of God. There's a similarity to what he's saying here the middle of chapter 2, to what he said at the beginning of chapter 1. We always thank God for you. At the beginning of chapter 1, it was because you received the gospel as it came to you. Here he's saying, we continually thank God for you because you received the word of God, as it was, not a human word, but the true word of God. So Paul uses these two terms and words throughout these first two chapters. He will use the term gospel five times in the first chapter and a half. 
of 1 Thessalonians. Here, he's switching that term to the word of God, but using these two terms interchangeably, he's trying to speak to the same thing, that thing being the message of Jesus. The message of Jesus Christ, the message of who Jesus is, the message about what he has done, that Jesus has entered into our world, he has paid the penalty for our sins through his death on the cross, he has come back to new life at his resurrection, and he has started and launched the process of making all things new. Paul is saying, we're thanking God continually because you have received that message for yourselves. They have received the message of Jesus. They have understood it to be true reality, a declaration of what's, what God is truly doing in our world through our Lord and Savior, Jesus. And in the process, what he's doing is he's making four statements through these first two chapters about what the word of God or what the gospel or what the message of Jesus is. And the first thing he's making a statement about in this stretch of chapter one and chapter two is that the message of Jesus is precious. It's a precious thing. He'll say in chapter two, verse four, that we were entrusted with the gospel. God gave us the message of Jesus. He entrusted it to us. It's kind of like this image of somebody being given something incredibly valuable and they're called to care for it and steward it and make sure they put it to good use, to be responsible with it. I can remember when I was uh, 16, my dad gave me the keys to his car for the first time, right? He said, I am trusting you with my car, which is my company car, by the way, right? Make sure you take really good care of this when you are out. Your life is also in the midst of this car, so make sure you handle this with care. I was entrusted with his car to use it whatever, however I needed and to be responsible with it. Paul is saying God has entrusted us with the words of God because sometimes words, we think of things as being valuable, like things have monetary value. But truthfully, there are times when words have value. That's what David says in Psalm 119, all over the place in Psalm 119. He said, your word, O God, is precious to me. Your word, O God, is valuable to me. It's more precious to me than pieces of gold and silver. Your word, O God, is sweeter to me than honey to my lips. He sees the word of God having great value and being incredibly precious to him. And it's not just the words themselves, but it's that these words capture a relationship that David has with God, and he finds that relationship to be precious. I can remember when Becky and I first started dating in grad school. She gave me like the first note, right? Even at like 22, 23, we're still passing notes in class, right? When we were grad students living on campus together, she gave me a card, and I remember it had this yellow, this yellow card with flowers and maybe a bee flying around it, and I read that card, and it's like, oh, oh, she loves me, <laughs> right? I took that card, and I put it in my desk in my dorm, and literally, I would like for a week, I read it every night like, oh man, I love this girl because she loves me, right? Those words were precious to me because they captured the relationship that Becky and I had together. So the word of God, Paul is saying, is, is precious. We have been entrusted with it and it speaks to the relationship that God desires to have with us. And not only is the word of God precious, the word of God also has power. He says in chapter 1, verse 5, that the gospel came to you with great power. So when kids are little, we, we often try and teach them that words have no power, right? Because often we, we teach kids, like if somebody insults you, if somebody says something negative to you, it has no power. It's just words. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. It's a big lie from the pit of hell, right? As adults, we know that, 
Like many of us are living with words turning over in our head that have been said about us somewhere along the way and they still hurt. They still shape who we are. Words have power. Proverbs 18 says there's power in the tongue. The tongue possesses the power of life or death and those who wield it will eat of its fruit. If we want to build people up with our words, hopefully we will reap the fruit of that. But if we tear people down with our words, we will probably reap the fruit of that. Words have great power. And what Paul is saying here in chapter 2, verse 13, he says, We continually thank God because you have received the word of God as it was, not human word, but the actual word of God. And then he goes on to say, which is indeed at work in you. The word of God saves, has power, power to save. The word of God also has power, the power to transform. Now, if you, if you know me, you know that I love coffee. I think tea is terrible. Sorry for you tea drinkers out there. But tea also, in this moment, serves as a good object lesson for us. Because when you put tea, a tea bag, into hot water, what is going to happen to the water? It's not a, it's not a trick question. <laughs> What's going to happen, right? The, the water is going to change, right? The, the water will be different. It, look at that. It takes seconds for the water to change, right? And so if we are like this water, Paul is encouraging us to allow the word to dwell in us because we will be changed by the word. Like instantly, everything about the water changes. It has a different taste. It has a different color. Right? We are said to be the aroma of Christ. We are said to take on the likeness of Christ. Paul uses all of these sensory words throughout the New Testament to describe who we are. And the longer, what's going to happen? The longer the tea bag stays in the water, what happens to the water? It gets darker. It gets richer. It gets more potent because the tea bag has dwelt longer in the water. It's the same with us in the Word. The longer the Word dwells, in us, the more and more we change. Paul here is saying, you've received the word of God. It's dwelling within you. It's at work within you, both to save and to transform. So he's saying the word of God is precious. The word of God has power. And then he goes on to say, the word invites our participation. He goes on to say, verse 14, for you, brothers and sisters, became imitators. You saw what was going on and you became imitators. The Greek word for imitator is mimetes, which you can kind of hear the word mimic, our English word mimic. Paul is talking about mimicking. And sometimes that can be used in a negative way. Like in our household right now, like our kids are mimicking each other to get under each other's skins and to push each other's buttons. But sometimes it's used in a real positive way. Like I see what's happening in your life. I, I want that to happen in my life. So I'm going to mimic what you are doing so that the life that you are living, I can have for myself. And Paul here is not actually talking about individuals though. He's actually talking about churches. He's saying, for you, brothers and sisters, the you there isn't singular. Sometimes we read you because we don't have a different word for a plural you in English. We have a singular you, which is the same as our plural you. So sometimes we read you in the Bible and we think Paul is talking to me singularly, but really Paul is talking to you, the community. So here he's saying, you as a community, brothers and sisters, you became imitators of God's churches. He's saying you as a whole community are imitating and mimicking what's happening in the church in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. Because the point of the, the word of God isn't to only receive it individually, it's a call to receive it collectively so that collectively we are being shaped into the likeness of Christ. And if a whole community of people is living in that way, hopefully other communities 
And other churches are saying, like, do you hear what's going on at Meadowbrook? Do you know what's happening at that church? How they're living radically, how they're loving their community. Perhaps we should see what they're doing and we should do the same. Paul is saying you collectively in Thessalonica are becoming imitators of the churches in Judea. The whole point of this is to participate with who God is and what he's doing in our world. Paul will write about that in Philippians. He says in Philippians chapter 3, I want you to know Christ. He says, he says of, this of himself, I want to know Christ. Yes, I want to know the power. There's that idea again, that power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings. Which sometimes when we think of participating in the life of Christ, we forget that. I want to participate in his power. I want to participate in the fruit that can come in my life. But Paul's saying, no, no, I want to participate. I want to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. Now, for us in our world today, participating in Christ's sufferings may not mean physical suffering, right? But it could very well mean and does mean a relinquishing of control, it does mean a lowering of yourself, taking on a lesser status in order to pour your life out to serve the church and reach out to the world. We live in a world that tries to insulate itself from hardship, from difficulty. And the gospel says you can walk right into it. You shouldn't be afraid of it. Because there is power in what you carry with you. As you participate in the hardship and the suffering of Christ, as you participate in the life of Christ, and when things don't go the way you think they should, there is power that you carry because there is power in the word. There is power in the gospel. Jesus says, if you want to follow me, pick up your cross daily. Lay your life down daily. Deny yourself daily. And then follow me. So the word of God, the message of Jesus, is precious, it's full of power, it invites our participation, and it enables perseverance. It enables perseverance. Because we live in a world that is a counterculture to the story of Jesus. Part of why following Jesus can be challenging is because our world flows in a different direction. We are always swimming upstream, if you will, when we follow Jesus. We move in the opposite direction of our world. So when the world says, indulge yourself, treat yourself, right? The gospel says, well, maybe you actually need to deny yourself. When the world says, think of yourself first, think of only yourself, take care of yourself, and only yourself, the gospel says you should actually think of others before yourself. And when the world says accumulate, hoard, stock up for yourself, make sure you have more than enough and insulate yourself from the world, the gospel says well, you live open-handedly and give sacrificially. Trust that the Lord is going to provide everything you need. Now, what Paul is talking about here in 1 Thessalonians is he's talking about how the church in Thessalonica is mimicking the church in Judea because the church in Judea is undergoing hardship, persecution, and suffering. And Paul says this in verse 14, you suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews. So meaning the churches in Judea are suffering hardship from their own people. The church in Thessalonica is also experiencing the same thing. And then he goes on to say, it's, it's those who killed Jesus and the prophets. He's describing who these people are who are persecuting them. And they drove us out also. They displease God and are hostile to everyone and in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. Paul is saying we're constantly hitting opposition. We're constantly hitting persecution. The church in Judea did and you did because we live counterculturally. And then he goes on to say, in this way, they, these people who resist the gospel, they also heap up their sins to the limit and the wrath of God has come on them all to the limit. Which we said last week, the wrath of God is simply God giving us over to the things that we want. And if we want to follow the world rather than the Lord, 
God's like, okay, I'm going to give that to you. The call of the gospel is to go counter to the world, which means we need perseverance, which means we need the power to do that. And we have that in the precious word of God. Now again, if we go back to Jumanji, you play the whole game Jumanji, and what happens at the end? The world goes back to the way that it's intended to be. And that's the same with us. Like, we know the end of the story. Like, we know that Jesus won when he was here on earth. We know that Jesus wins at the end of time when he returns to set all things right. And so, in the meantime, we move forward living in a counterintuitive way, going against the current of our culture, carrying with us the gospel, which is full of power, which is precious, which is the greatest story ever told. And we are people who embody that and participate in that.